Number five, The Yellow Wallpaper. Okay, The Yellow Wallpaper. I first read this book when I was in fifth grade, and I do know that it is a lot of required reading for a lot of people. Like, you'd read it in ninth or tenth grade. So you may be thinking now, oh my god, V, why would you put this on the list? It's not cursed, we can all read it. It's a weird book. And it's a good book, a really flipping good book. And I know that we have a lot of videos on this channel of books that are cursed that you cannot read and that you will never get the chance to read. So I wanted to create a video about books that are going to mess up your head and twist your psychology into a complete knot. But if a complete mind twist doesn't interest you and you would prefer hearing about the more supernatural aspects of Top 5 Scary, just search books on our channel's search bar and you will get a plethora of videos to choose from. Today I really want to talk about things that we can all relate to, but if you are interested in some reading that will mess your mind up and leave you scared and thinking for the rest of your life, definitely stick around because we are about to get into some really cool and twisted reading. So number 4 or number 5 and four now because I rambled too much. Let's try this again, The Yellow Wallpaper. This book is a masterclass in imagery and descriptive devices because wow, you feel like you are in this room. It follows a woman who is placed into a room that is lined wall to wall with yellow wallpaper and slowly, page by page, she begins to go insane. Describing more outlandish and detailed scenes being played out in the lines of her wallpaper. Throughout the story, her descriptions get so much more in depth and twisted and you begin to feel like you are going insane with her. Every single word, every single thing that she is imagining, you are seeing full on face to face. It's like you're looking it in the eyes. And I have aphantasia, so I actually cannot visualize anything in my head. Like you say, think of an apple and I don't see an apple. It's just darkness. But somehow this book was able to surpass my biological evolution. And I was able to imagine everything, every word, every description, it was being burnt into my eyelids. And there are very few books that can do that for me, which is how you know that this is an insanely weird and well written story. I really recommend giving this a read. It will mess with your mind and you will never ever want to have yellow wallpaper again, which okay, interestingly enough, this book actually made me want to have yellow wallpaper when I was in the fifth grade. So I don't know, maybe this job is like where I was destined to work because I don't think many people after reading this book would yearn so desperately to have yellow wallpaper. Number three, I have no mouth and I must scream. I don't even know where to start with this one. This book left me with such a disturbed and upset feeling right into the pit of my stomach. The story follows a group of five people, the last people alive in a post-apocalyptic earth that are being eternally tormented in a computer called Am. Okay, so the first time I read this, I was pretty confused up until I would say probably the second page and then I started getting really, really into it. But I think you're supposed to be confused so you can really settle into the story and the world and all of the ideas within. The book centers around five characters who are essentially stuck in an advanced AI computer called Am in a post-apocalyptic world. The computer is vengeful and torments them eternally. They have been stuck here, unaging, essentially immortalized for 109 years, allegedly. It's okay, it's kind of hard to know for sure because the computer like messes with their mind and time a lot. Every single day for these humans is filled with the computer, psychologically, physically tormenting them in every way imaginable in insanely disturbing and creative ways. The book ends with the character who we are hearing the story from realizing that the only way to end the torment they are experiencing and to hurt the computer in some way is like revenge is through their death or by taking away Am's toys. Somehow he ends up being the last one alive. I won't spoil it exactly, but everyone else is dead except for him. Am is very, very upset by this. So Am ensures that for the rest of eternity, he, the last alive, will suffer every day and will never be given the chance to escape through death like the others. He is essentially turned, he is essentially turned into a living blob, lacking limbs and appendages, just, wait, lacking limbs and appendages, lacking ears and eyes and a mouth. He's just a mass of goo. His eye sockets are described as being filled with a white fog. He is stuck unmoving for the rest of his eternal life, which of course brings us to the final line of the book and the title, I have no mouth and I must scream. So yeah, this is an incredibly disturbing book. Cursed, I guess you could say. I would definitely recommend giving the story a read. It is short, but the impact it will have on you is nothing less than long lasting and permanent. 
Number two, The Lottery. I first read this book a couple of months ago in July. It was an English camp retreat that I read it at, which I won't get too much into, but let's just say I did not enjoy that too much. I was one of two girls in a group of 18 guys, and they were all years younger than me, and most of them weren't funny and mansplained everything to me, which is my worst nightmare, and it was painful. But actually, from the teachers, it was a very educational experience, and I learned a lot. And one of the things I learned about was this story, The Lottery. It is a short story written by the famous Shirley Jackson and it definitely makes you think. Upon first read, it definitely gives off Hunger Games vibes, and I'm sorry I said vibes, but there is no other way to explain it. Same vibes. It is a very surprising read. I think you'll be surprised by the ending, but upon rereading it, you kind of realize how brutally obvious every piece of foreshadowing was. But upon the first read, you're left with an uneasy feeling. You do not expect what's to come. Especially up until the third page, you really don't realize how uneasy everyone is in the story. You hear about a tradition that other towns are considering canceling. You hear about these very young people going around in groups of friends and picking up pebbles that are being collected in piles after being released from school. You hear casual conversation being exchanged through neighbors. You don't hear the underlying unease that is being sown throughout the crowd of people. Someone goes up to the front of the crowd and next to a dinky yet looming box, they begin to explain that they will be drawing names, like every year in this town's annual lottery. The reader thinks, oh, again, a lottery, a winner. This is exciting, this is cool, this is great, but you do not expect the ending. And for me, it was kind of a whoa moment where I had to take a step back and reevaluate where the book had shifted to. It's a great book filled with eerie imagery and explanations, and another that will absolutely stay burned into your mind. Number one, The Landlady. This book is by one of my all time favorite authors, Roald Dahl, responsible for creating some of the most famous stories of all time, like Matilda. The Witches, James and the Giant Peach, The BFG, Lamb to the Slaughter, and so, so, so many more, it's no surprising that he would be capable of creating a truly disturbing short story very worthy of being on this list. So the landlady follows a boy named Billy who is starting a new job in a new town. He looks for a place to stay the night when all of a sudden he sees a beautifully charming and warm house advertising itself as a bed and breakfast. It is run by a friendly but odd lady, and only two guests had previously previously stayed there in the past three years. We know there have only been two guests thanks to a guest book that the old woman makes every single guest who stays there sign, which she tells Billy, and when Billy is signing it, he recognizes the two names, which are the only ones on it, but he can't remember where he recognizes them from, though he feels like they were both famous for the same thing, like they were in a newspaper or something for the same thing. I won't spoil anything because uncovering the truth yourself is far more exciting. Throughout the book, you feel an un easy sense of dread, discomfort, and frustration as the naive main character innocently believes everything he is being told and does not seem to comprehend the idea that he could be in danger. It is an extremely captivating book and I find the descriptions to be very, very lively. The dialogue is eerie and sets the tone of the story masterfully. This book leaves you with a sinking feeling like no other. If you are looking for a read that will stay in your mind every time you check into a small B&B, which you know, I I don't, it's not very common anymore. This is definitely the book for you. Number five, The Complete Book of Demonolatry. Written by S. Connolly, it boasts telling the reader how to discover powerful rites, magic, and practices that honor Satan and the demons. This text, used by the traditional demonolatry priesthood to train members of their covens, is part workbook, part textbook, and part reference book. It includes thorough chapters on demonolatry, history, demonic holy days, offerings, prayers, sigils, religious rites, and an introduction to demonology demonology magic. Okay, this might be the first book I'm tempted to buy for myself. If only just to learn more about like demonology history from somebody that isn't, you know, like Ed Warren for once. I love the Warrens and their work, but at the same time, it would be neat to learn from a lens that isn't, you know, as biased in Catholicism. All right, let's see what else it advertises. Learn how and why the ends, demonology sigils, ascension, and many other demonology methods have become standard practice among many theistic Satanists. It claims to guide students from pre-initiate to adept, and even delves into the depths of demonolatry, um, schmeck's magic, necromancy, scarlet elixir rites, and red fluid sacrifice. See, that last phrase I can do without. But let me know what y'all think in the comments. 
Should I bother investing in it or not? Now before anybody asks, well why should you leave this book alone on Halloween? That just so happens to be when the veil between our world and the spirit world is the thinnest and you don't want to accidentally summon a demon when you're just learning how to. Not a fun idea. Uh, number 4. Mein Kampf Alrighty folks, this is where I'm using demonic as more as an adjective instead of actually talking about demons. Also this is a book that should never be consumed in general. More like exist in a museum so that we keep, you know, don't turn into a case of those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. This is an autobiography of Germany's infamous actually Austrian born dictator whose name I can't say on here. Its title means my struggle or battle because you know, organizing genocide is hard work. Didn't you know? Everybody clap for this man's tenacity, his perseverance, his sheer determination. Hard work makes dreams come true, don't you know? Ugh, the prick. The book, released in two volumes, is in reality the evil dictator's case for anti Semitism. He outlines exactly how he came to be as he was before putting forth his racial and political views and describing his vision for the future of Germany. From a technical point of view, this book is apparently overly long, repetitious, and poorly written. You know, seeing as it was written by one of the world's most evil men in history, it was deemed just cause for banning it in Austria and Russia. Interestingly, enough, Germany held the copyright over this book until 2016. Until then, printing and dissemination of the work was strictly banned. But now that it's you know in the public domain, Germany has lifted the ban and actually released a new edition with nearly 2,000 pages and 3,500 annotated notes. I'm not sure this particular book should be available, simply because it was written by the man I cannot name. You know, the fact that he killed 6 million people for no fault of their own is unforgivable enough, but the conditions he kept them and many more in is making me sick to my stomach. So we're going to move on before I start venting and get off topic today. Number 3. The Grand Gamora it is a black magic grimoire, and for reference, a grimoire is a textbook of magic that typically includes instructions on how to create magical objects like talismans and amulets, how to perform magical spells, charms, and divination, and how to summon or invoke supernatural entities such as angels, spirits, deities, and demons. In many cases, the books themselves are believed to be imbued with magical powers, although in many cultures, other sacred texts that are not grimoires, such as the Bible, have been believed to have supernatural properties intrinsically. The only contents found in a grimoire would be information on spells, rituals, the preparation of magical tools, and lists of ingredients in their magical correspondences. In this manner, while all books on magic could be thought of as grimoires, not all magical books should be thought of as grimoires. Different editions date the specific one to 1521, 22, or even like as early as 1421, but it was probably written during like the early 19th century. Some experts suggest that 1702 is when the first edition may have been created, and a Bibliothèque Bleu version, similar to like a chapter book, of the text might have been published in 1750. The introductory chapter was authored by Antonio Veneciana da Rabina, who gathered his information from the original writings of King Solomon. Much of the material of this grimoire derives from the Key of Solomon and the Lesser Key of Solomon, which are grimoires attributed to the king of the same name. Also known as Le Dragon Rouge or the Red Dragon, this book contains instructions on how to summon Lucifer or Lucifer Refocal for the purpose of forming a deal with the devil. The 19th century French occultist Ephile Faz Lévy, author of Dogme et Rituel de la Haute Magie, claimed the contemporary edition of Le Dragon Rouge was a counterfeit of a true older grand grimoire. And I just, I love petty historical spats. Once again, the overall the work is divided into two books. So the first book contains instructions for summoning a demon and the construction of tools with which to force a demon to do one's bidding. The second book is divided further into two parts, the Sanctum Regnum and Secrets de l'Art Magique du Grand Grimoire. The Sanctum Regnum contains instructions for making a pact with the demon, allowing one to command the spirit without the tools required by book one, but at greater risk. Secrets contain secret spells and rituals one can employ after having performed the ritual of the first book. Now, Some editions contain a short text between the two parts, known as Le Secret Magique, ou le grand art de pouvoir parler aux morts, or in English, the magic secret or the grand art of being able to speak with the dead, which deals with necromancy. The book describes several demons as well as the rituals to summon them in order to make a pact with them. It also details several spells for winning a lottery, talking to spirits, being loved by somebody else, making oneself invisible, and more. This book mentions three greater demons, which are similarly prioritized in the Grimorium Verum. Sidebar, in the English translation of the work, the demons are referenced by the more generic term of spirits, which is a term I know some modern Satanists prefer. The demons that are mentioned are the Emperor Lucifer, Prince Beelzebub, Prince Beelzebub, and the Grand Duke Astaroth. Now, this work also makes mention of six lesser demons, and of course, I'll mention them all: Lucifer, Grofocal, Prime Minister, Saint Nachia, Commander in Chief, Aglia Rept, Commandant, Fleurti, Lieutenant General, Sargatanas, Brigadier Major, Nebiros, Marshal, and Inspector General. I had fun with that. Number two, the Grimorium Verum. Hmm, I just mentioned this, didn't I? The Grimorium Verum, which is Latin for true grimoire, is an 18th century grimoire attributed to one Ali Beck the Egyptian of Memphis, who wrote it in 1517, and like many grimoires, it claims a tradition originating with King Solomon. The 
This grimoire is actually not a translation of an earlier work, with its original appearing in French or Italian in the mid 18th century, as noted by A. E. Waite, who discussed the work in his book of ceremonial magic in 1911, stating the date specified in the title of the Grimorium Verum is undeniably fraudulent since the work belongs to the middle of the 18th century and Memphis is Rome. One version of the grimoire was included as the Clavicles of King Solomon, Book 3, in one of the French manuscripts S. L. McGregor Mathers, incorporated in his version of the Key of Solomon, but it was omitted from the key with this explanation. At the end, there are some short extracts from the Grimorium Verum with the seals of evil spirits, which, as they do not belong to the Key of Solomon proper, I have not given. For the evident classification of the key is in two books and no more. Idris Shah also published some of it in the Secret Lore of Magic, Book of the Sorcerers, in 1957. Alrighty, time to break down all four books that you should not be touching on Halloween. Book one is described as concerning the character of demons, particularly the superior spirits of Lucifer, Beelzebub, Astaroth, while also including the many inferior spirits below them and their invoking sig ah, while also including the many inferior spirits below them and their invoking sigils. Alright, who wants to hear about what all the lesser spirits can do? Klonek has the power to bring money to those who make a pact with them. Musisin has power over important people and politicians. Freemost has power over women. Yeah, okay, bow. Klipoth can help you experience all sorts of dreams and visions. Kill can manifest dramatic situations and changes. Mercild has dominion over long and short distance travel. Klistert can create confusion or enlightenment depending on what you need or want. Sir Chad can make you see all sorts of natural and supernatural creatures. Hickpax can make a person think of you, no matter how far or distant they may be. Humots can bring you any book you desire. Siegel will cause all sorts of prodigies to appear. Fruxisier can teach you the art of necromancy. Guland causes all illnesses. Sergat can create every kind of opportunity for advancement. Morel can help you move about unseen. Frutimier prepares all kinds of feasts for you. Hoitigaras causes sleep in the case of some and insomnia in others. And hey, tempting, because I could use a good night's sleep right about now. Book two is simply described as being a planetary hours, so I'll leave it up to y'all to interpret what you think it means. Book three Three is the preparation of the operator, or more simply put, how to prepare for summoning. A more modern title could be Demon Summoning for Dummies, or How to Summon a Demon 101. Book 4 contains the Sanctum Regnum, also called the Royalty of Spirits, or the Little Key of Solomon, a most learned Hebraic necromancer and rabbi. This book contains various combinations of characters whereby the powers can be invoked or brought forth whensoever you may wish, each according to his faculty. Long story short, it's a very descriptive and thorough demon summoning bible if you will. Once again, I personally do not recommend summoning demons, but if you really feel feel like you must. This feels like it would produce safer outcomes than say like a random YouTube ritual or a Ouija board, but still, stay away on Halloween. You don't know what's going to happen, I don't know what's going to happen, it's not fun. Number 1. The 120 Days of Sodom Written in Bastille during the French Revolution, the author was interrupted when the prison was stormed by insurgents and never finished the story. But 120 Days remains amongst the most notorious works of literature, featuring depraved fetishes, red fluid soaked sexual group parties, torment and under the age of consent, bad icky Schmeck's thing. Look, I'd say the actual terms if I could. Trust me, it would make my life so much easier, but I've got to play by the interweb rules. Described as very sexual and erotic, its plot revolves around the activities of four wealthy Libertine men who spend four months seeking out the ultimate sexual gratification through group sex fun parties, sealing themselves away in an inaccessible castle in the heart of the Black Forest in Germany with four madams and a harem of 36 victims, mostly young people. The madams relate stories of their most memorable clients, whose crimes and punishments inspire the Libertines to likewise and increasingly harm their victims to their eventual deaths. Now, the novel was never completed. Its first chapter was written according to Say's written plan, but the subsequent chapters are in the form of rough drafts and notes, often consisting of graphic descriptions of the novel scenes. The book was first published in Germany back in 1904 and then banned across Europe for most of the 20th century. A 1975 film adaptation by Pier Paolo Pasolini was also banned in several countries. South Korea has banned the book twice a century, and now it can be sold there only in a sealed plastic cover to adults 19 or over. Once again, don't read it. Enoch is an ancient Hebrew apocalyptic religious text, ascribed by tradition to the patriarch Enoch, who is the father of Methuselah and the great grandfather of Noah. So this contains unique material on the origins of demons and more, uh, along with why some angels fell from heaven, an explanation of why the Genesis flood was morally necessary, and an exposition of the thousand year reign of the Messiah. So there's at least three books that are traditionally attributed to the prophet, including the distinct works 2 and 3. None of those are considered to be canonical scripture by most Jewish or Christian church bodies, ergo why a lot of folks want this kind of banned in out of the way. The older sections of it are estimated to date from about 300 to 200 BC. The latest part is about like 100 BC. A lot of scholars believe this was originally written in probably Hebrew, since these were the languages first used for Jewish texts. Now, 
Some folks suggest that this, kind of like the book of Daniel, was composed partially in Hebrew, but fun fact, no Hebrew version has survived. The individuals residing in the Qumran caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls and the book were unearthed were not aligned with the mainstream Jewish sect known as the Pharisees. Instead, they were affiliated with a splinter group who adhered to distinctive practices. So ergo, this book, alongside numerous other texts discovered in the caves, is recognized for its substantial variance from things that we know. So authors of the New Testament were also familiar with some content of the stories. Like a short section of one Enoch is cited in the New Testament of Jude and attributed there to Enoch the seventh from Adam. But this is kind of a variance on a lot of other things that are more mainstream. Copies of the earlier sections of Enoch 1 were preserved among the Dead Sea Scrolls, like I mentioned already. So this book only survives in its entirety in Ethiopic translation. Yes, it is part of the biblical canon used by the Ethiopian Jewish community, as well as the Christian Ethiopian Orthodox Church. But a lot of other groups regard it as non-canonical or non-inspired. They do accept it as having historical or theological interest, but they kind of don't want to accept it as canon, ergo they kind of want it out of the way. The Acts and Monuments, popularly known as Fox's Book of Martyrs, is a work of Protestant history and martyrology by Protestant English historian John Fox, first published in 1563 by John Day. It includes an account of the sufferings of Protestants under the Catholic Church, with particular emphasis on England and Scotland. Now, this book was highly influential in those countries and helped shape lasting popular notions of Catholicism there. The book went through four editions in Fox's lifetime, and a number of later editions and abridgments, including some that specifically reduced the text to a book of martyrs. After the Reformation, Catholic apologists raised the issue of the novelties of Protestant doctrines as exploiting religious credulity for material and intercourse-related ends. So Protestant apologists, such as Calvinist Anglican John Fox, sought to establish the continuity of a pro-Protestant piety from apostolic times to the Reformation. So yeah, the author's credibility was challenged as soon as the book first appeared. A lot of folks accused Fox of dealing falsely with the evidence, misusing documents, and of telling partial truths. In every case that he could clarify, Fox corrected errors in the second edition, and the third, and the fourth. But by this point, Fox was considered a poor historian, in at least mainstream reference works. The 1911 Encyclopedia Britannica said this of Fox, The gross blunders due to carelessness have often been exposed, and there is no doubt that Fox was only too ready to believe evil of the Catholics, and he cannot always be exonerated from the charge of willful falsification of evidence. It should, however, be remembered in his honor that his advocacy of religious toleration was far in advance of his day. Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure, popularly known as Fanny Hill, is a naughty novel by the English novelist John Cleland, first published in London in 1748. Written while the author was in debtor's prison in London, it is considered the first original English prose smut, and the first smut to use the form of the novel. It is one of the most prosecuted and banned books in history. This book exemplifies the use of euphemism. The text has no swearing or explicit scientific terms for body parts, but it uses a a lot of literary devices to describe genitalia. For example, the hoo-ha is sometimes referred to as the nethermouth, which is also an example of psychological displacement. A critical edition by Peter Saber includes a bibliography and a lot of notes that are kind of useful. The collection launching Fanny Hill contains several essays on the historical, social, and economic themes underlying the novel. Initially, there was actually no government reaction to it, but in November of 1749, a year after the first installment was published, the author and Ralph Griffiths were arrested and charged with corrupting the king's subjects. So the book eventually made its way to the US, and by 1821, a Massachusetts court outlawed it completely. The publisher, Peter Holmes, was convicted for printing a lewd and obscene novel. So Holmes appealed to the Massachusetts Supreme Court. He claimed that the judge, relying only on the prosecution's description, hadn't even seen the book. The state Supreme Court was not swayed. The Chief Justice wrote that Holmes was a scandalous and evil-disposed person who had contrived to debauch and corrupt the citizens of Massachusetts, and to raise and create in their minds inordinate and lustful desires. In 1963, after the 1960 court decision in R vs. Penguin Books Limited, that allowed the continuing publication of Lady Chatterley's Lover, Gareth Powell's Mayflower Books published an uncensored paperback version of Fanny Hill. The police became aware of the 1963 edition a couple days before publication, having spotted a sign in the window of the magic shop in Tottenham Court Road in London, run by Ralph Gold. 
Well, an officer went to the shop, bought a copy, and delivered it to a magistrate, Sir Robert Blundell, who issued a search warrant. At the same time, two officers from the Metropolitan Police's Obscene Publications branch visited Mayflower Books. Why? Well, they wanted to determine whether copies of the books were kept on the premises. They interviewed Powell, the publisher, and took away five copies. Just five. Well, then the police returned to the magic shop and seized 171 copies of the book. And in December, Gold was summoned under Section 3 of the Obscene Publications Act. By then, Mayflower had distributed 82,000 copies of the book. But it was Gold who was being tried. But Mayflower did cover the legal costs. The trial took place in February of 1964. And the defense argued that Fanny Hill was a historical source book. And that it was a joyful celebration of normal, non-icky intercourse. You know, it was body rather than sinful. Well, the prosecution countered by stressing one atypical scene involving flagellation, and they won. Written in Bastille during the French Revolution, The 120 Days of Sodom is a heck of a book. So the author was actually interrupted when the prison was stormed by insurgents and never finished the story. But it remains amongst the most notorious works of literature throughout history, featuring a lot of depraved stuff, red fluid soaked naughty group parties, torment and under the age of consent, batty icky things, and a lot more that I can't say because the internet's a fun place. Described as very naughty, its plot revolves around the activities of four wealthy libertine men seeking out the ultimate way of gratifying themselves through group parties, sealing themselves away in an inaccessible castle in the heart of the Black Forest in Germany with four madams and a harem of 36 victims. The madams relate stories of their most memorable clients, whose crimes and punishments inspire the libertines to likewise and increasingly harm their victims to their eventual deaths. Now, this novel was actually never completed. Its first chapter was written according to Sade's written plan, but the subsequent chapters are in the form of rough drafts and notes, often consisting of graphic descriptions of the novel scenes. So this book was first published in Germany in 1904 and then banned across Europe for much of the 20th century. In 1975, film adaptation was also banned in several countries. South Korea has banned the book twice a century, and now it can only be sold there if you're like 19 or up. And finally for today, Mein Kampf is a book that should really only exist in a museum, so that we don't turn into a case of those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. This is an autobiography of Germany's infamous, actually Austrian-born dictator. Its title means my struggle, because yeah, okie dokie dude. It's been described as like, hey everybody, give this man, you know, a big round of applause for his perseverance, his sheer determination, because hard work makes dreams come true. The book, released in two volumes, is in reality the evil dictator's case for all the bad things he did. He outlines exactly how he came to be, well, who he was, before putting forth his views and describing his vision for the future of Germany. Interestingly enough, Germany actually held the copyright over it until 2016. And until then, printing and distributing this book was banned. But now that it's in the public domain, well, the ban's been lifted. There was actually a new edition released a little while back, but still, when you think about who wrote it, I'm not saying it should be completely erased from history, but maybe it should just be kept in a museum. If cursing power were based solely on a book's size, the Codex Gigas, otherwise known as the Devil's Bible, would probably be the most dangerous book ever written, weighing in at a whopping 165 pounds and measuring about three feet in height. The roughly 800-year-old tome is thought to be the world's largest surviving medieval manuscript. Codex Gigas literally means a giant book. It doesn't get any more simple than that, folks. The manuscript's exact origins have been lost to time, but historians believe it was written at some point between 1204 and 1230 in the Kingdom of Bohemia, part of what would become the Czech Republic. According to the National Library of Sweden, the book was owned by at least three different monasteries before Emperor Rudolf II added it to his private collection, which would also soon include the Voynich Manuscript in 1594. Now, I won't necessarily be talking about that manuscript today, but it's an approximately 600-year-old mystery that continues to stump scholars scholars, cryptographers, physicists, and computer scientists. That one is a roughly only 240-page medieval codex written in an indecipherable language, brimming with bizarre drawings of esoteric plants, nude women, and astrological symbols. It defies classification, much less comprehension. So not cursed, but still a good mystery. Sorry, I know. Sidetracked again. ADHD is fun. Back to the Codex we go. In 1648, it was claimed by the Swedish army during the Thirty Years' War and taken to Stockholm, and has been housed in Sweden's National Library since 1768. While many illuminated texts were produced by teams of scribes, scholars believe the Codex Gigas is the work of a single copyist. Written entirely in Latin, the book contains both the Old and New Testaments, along with Czech and Jewish history texts, an encyclopedia with information on geometry, legal matters and entertainment, among other topics, medical stuff, hundreds of obituaries, 
several magic spells, and a calendar. Just a good catch-all anthology if you ask me. You got a little bit of everything. The book's sinister reputation stems from a full-color portrait of the devil contained in its pages, and a legend about how the image got there. So if we're going to consult the folklore, the book is the work of a monk. Possibly, let's see if I get this right, Hermanus Hermitus, or... Herman the Recluse, who had broken his vows and been sentenced to be walled up alive in the monastery. He had struck a deal to save himself. If, over the course of a single night, he could write a book containing all the world's knowledge, his life would be spared. When he realized the task was impossible, because no SHIT Sherlock, the monk sold his soul to the devil, who helped him finish the book and signed it with the now infamous portrait. Other versions of the story say the monk added the illustration as a gesture of gratitude for Satan's assistance, but nevertheless, the portrait is there, and boy oh boy is it off to look at. There are several tales of misfortune attached to the codex, but the curse seems to be fairly benign, when you consider the book was apparently also co-written by Beelzebub. One legend dating back to at least 1858 maintains that a guard was institutionalized after being accidentally locked in Sweden's National Library overnight, and he was supposedly found under a table the next morning, claiming to have seen the Codex join a procession of books as they danced through the air. Yeah, not a book I plan on visiting anytime soon. Written in the early 1600s by Martin de Leon Cardenas, the orphan story is a novel about a young Spaniard who heads to the Americas in search of fortune. Well, it may sound like a normal adventure story, and an outlier amongst the magical books I'm about to talk about today. A major darkness lurks within its pages that led to the novel not being published until 2018. The first draft was a 328-page manuscript that was slightly yellowed, a little bit worn, a little bit aged, missing a couple of pages. Which, you know, on the surface sounds pretty tame, but you've got to assume otherwise if I'm making a point of it. It is handwritten in a decorative style reflective of the golden or imperial age. I'm not super sure. The new age print takes on a more modern bound look, featuring artwork from the original manuscript on the front, any rather plain book front past that. Belinda Peliasos, a Peruvian scholar who edited the book for two years, says that she was warned by multiple people about this manuscript. It was first set to appear in 1621 under the pen name of Andres de Leon, but never made it to the press due to the presidential atmosphere at the time in Sicily. If you know, you know. The manuscript then sat in the Hispanic Society of America until 1965 when Belinda rediscovered it. She learned about the many attempts to publish the story, giving rise to rumors that malevolent energy lurked among the pages, causing the people who worked on it to pass. In an interview, she commented on the reported deaths, saying one was from a strange disease, another in a car accident, and something, something, something else for the other. Belinda had also heard from other professors she was working with to publish the book, one who specialized in colonial letters from the Andean regions in Mexico, who was named Raquel Chang Rodriguez. Raquel's letters describe how Antonio Rodriguez Manino and William C. Bryant both died before finishing their editions of the book. And that's why the manuscript is believed to be cursed or bewitched. They told her that the book was cursed. And the reason it took them so long to publish that was, well, if you work on it, you're gonna die in some sort of weird, mysterious way. Did the powers that be not want the ancient script out in the world? Note to self, don't go within 10 feet of the book. Not worth it. Here's an obvious inclusion into our list today, the Necronomicon. Look, I should get brownie points somewhere for holding out for a year before talking about this gem. Inspired by an H.P. Lovecraft story, this book was published in the 70s by an anonymous author only identified by the pen name Simon, believed to actually be Peter Lavenda, but can't prove that. The first editions, of which I'm not kidding, only 666 copies were released, were bound in leather, but later on it would be published in paperback, becoming an immediate bestseller. In this version's prologue, Simon claims that this is no fictional book, but a translation of a Greek manuscript containing the Necronomicon. The introduction to the book, which is about 80 pages of the 263, is the only part that Simon claims were written. It relates how Simon and his associates were introduced to a Greek translation of the Necronomicon, I love saying that word, by a mysterious monk. Simon claims that after experimenting with the text, they verified that the work is a genuine collection of magical rituals that predates most known religions, and warns that anyone attempting to use this might unleash dangerous forces. In addition to an introduction, the book uses a frame story titled The Testimony of the Mad Arab. The testimony is in two parts forming a prologue and an epilogue to the core. The author describes himself as, you guessed it, Mad Arab. I'll just call it Mad. The prologue explains how Mad first came to discover the dark secrets that he's recording, accidentally witnessing an arcane ritual performed by a cult that worships Tiamat, in which both the demons Cthulhu and Humwawa are conjured. In the epilogue, Mad is haunted by premonitions of his gruesome death. He realizes that the horrors of the Necronomicon are enraged and seek revenge upon him for revealing their existence to the world. He is unable to sign his work and thus remains nameless. This version mixes pseudo-Sumerian mythology with Lovecraft's universe, and it includes rituals that supposedly 
supposedly allow the reader to summon the gods and demons of these myths. It has also been linked to the Satanic Church, as it kind of alludes to Aleister Crowley's teachings. And if you know anything about that name, you'll understand why that's a name to be worried about being associated with anything. Ever heard of Tomino's Hell? Rather than a full book, bear with me here, it's a cursed poem included in Sakin, a poem compilation dating back to 1919 by a Japanese poet and songwriter. It tells the journey of a Tomino, a young boy who has been sent to hell after he committed an unforgivable sin. The poem later served as an inspiration for a film called Pastoral to Die in the Country. The filmmaker died nine years later, and well, the poem was blamed for it. Since then, it has become an instant urban legend, suggesting that anybody who reads the poem will either die in a couple of days, or eh, be haunted by Tomino's spirit. Six one way, half a dozen the other, right? And finally for today, the Book of Soiga is an occult text that dates back to at least the 1500s. We only know about it because it was once owned by John Dee, a famous 16th century polymath whose fields of study and expertise included mathematics, physics, chemistry, and astronomy. Dee was also an occultist who was particularly interested in communicating with angels. This book must have been irresistible to him. Besides magical spells and writings about demonology and astrology, the text includes the names and genealogies of angels. Look, it's a nice exchange from the usual books of demons I hear about. Let me have this one. According to Benjamin Woolley's D biography, The Queen's Conjurer, D believed the book contained an ancient, even divine message written in the language originally spoken to Adam. In other words, the true unspoiled word of God. I know a lot of people who would love to see that. It also includes 36 cryptic tables that remained undeciphered for centuries. D attempted to crack their code with the help of Edward Kelly, a crystal gazer who convinced D he could channel the voices of angels. Kelly sometimes spelled his name by K E L L Y instead of being K E L L E Y, or went by Edward Talbot. Having aliases was probably helpful to the supposed medium, who had reportedly been convicted of counterfeiting and might have had his ears cut off as punishment. According to Sky History, D was so eager to talk to angels that when Kelly told him the angels wanted the two men to swap wives for an evening at as payment for celestial communication, D was like, heck yes. Nine months later, Theodore was born. Yeah, that's something you don't hear about every day. He was in Kelly as he go between, D dialed up the archangel Uriel and asked him if the Book of Soiga was a real deal. Uriel, speaking through Kelly, assured him that it was, but told him that only the archangel Michael was authorized to translate the tables, but he wasn't available, a busy schedule or something. This exchange might be the source of the Book of Soiga's reputation as a cursed book, or as it is sometimes known, the book that kills. At one point, D mentioned to Uriel that he'd been told he died within two and a half years if he ever read the encoded text. Uriel assured Dee that he'd lived for more than 100 years. Dee died in 1608 at the age of 81. The book changed hands a couple of times before vanishing from historical record. Fast forward 300 years, summer of 1994, Deborah Harkness had just finished her doctoral dissertation and was browsing through the catalog at Oxford's Bodleian Library when she found a reference to the text in question. She had the book brought up and soon found herself staring at the holy grail of Dee's scholarship. The experience inspired her first novel, The Discovery of Witches, which kicked off a best-selling trilogy and has since been adapted for television, which loved to see it. In 1998, mathematician Jim Reeds cracked the code of its mysterious tables. Reeds discovered a pattern involving the frequency and position of certain letters in relation to the other letters, or in his words, a letter is obtained by counting a certain number of letters after the letter immediately above it in the table. Make of that what you will. Reeds came up with a set of mathematical formulae that allowed him to decipher the tables, each of which turned out to be based on a six-letter code word. But we still don't know the meaning of those code words or what messages the tables were meant to communicate, or if there even is one. Should be scary enough on its own, but time to elaborate, I suppose. These manuscripts were believed to be written in the early 1900s, as their first library appearance was around the 1920s. These books originated when a Wiccan high priestess called Persephone Adrasta Irene recorded her family's spiritual history of being an American witch of Swedish and English ancestry. These manuscripts record Persephone's witchy history that she reworked all through her adult life, incorporating her mother's grimoire into them as well. The first book contains around 250 pages of spells incantations, curses, and enchantments, as well as corresponding information on gems, planets, rites, potions, and even exorcisms. The second book includes around 150 to 200 pages of alchemy and chemistry recipes, cures, perfumes, and balms, nerve tonics, and even hairspray recipes. I could use that. The first book is believed to carry the curse heavier than its counterpart, as Persephone's spells are believed in Wiccan culture to contain more power than most other records due to the embodiment of herself within them. Originally, the books belonged to Alice Montserrat, the wife of Israel Regardi, who moved to the UK in the 1920s to work with famous occult writer Alistair Crowley. 
If you know, you know. Later on, they both went on to work with the Golden Dawn Order and printed their works and publications as occultism raised into the modern world. Though Montserrat did little reporting on the cursed lore over these books, she did make notes as to why she and others within the Order believe the curse carried some serious weight. She made a note to an inscription warning all those who read it, saying, To those not of the craft, the reading of this book is forbidden. Proceed no further, or justice will exact a swift and terrible retribution, and you will surely suffer at the hand of the craft. This was written not only in English, but other languages as well to ensure the reader be heavily warned to uh, keep away. To this day, copies of the Untitled Grimoires can be bought from M. Benjamin Katz Fine Books and Rare Manuscripts in Toronto. They still come with a high warning for all non-believers within Wiccan or Pagan beliefs to shy away from them because of the cursed lore within and surrounding their pages. As tempting as it might be to acquire a copy, since that is a place I could technically travel to, I don't want to risk fate. My life is crazy enough. Trust me. Number four, the Grand Grimoire. Yep, it's a black magic grimoire. And for reference, because I don't think I elaborated last time, a grimoire is a textbook of magic. You know, it typically includes instructions on how to create magical objects like talismans and amulets, how to perform magical spells, charms, and divination, and how to summon or invoke supernatural entities such as angels, spirits, deities, and demons. In many cases, the books themselves are believed to be imbued with magical powers. Although in many cultures, other sacred texts that are not grimoires, such as the Bible, have been believed to have supernatural powers intrinsically. The only contents found in a grimoire would be information on spells, rituals, the preparations of magical tools, and lists of ingredients and their magical counterparts. In this manner, while all books of magic could be thought of as grimoires, not all magical books should be thought of as grimoires. Different editions date the specific one to 1521, 22, or 1421, but it was probably written during the early 19th century. Some experts suggest that 1702 is when the first edition may have been created as a Bibliothèque Bleu version, similar to a chapter book since that version was published in 1750. The introductory chapter was authored by Antonio Veneziana del Rabina, who gathered his information from original writings of King Solomon. Much of the material of this grimoire derives from the Key of Solomon and Lesser Key of Solomon, which are grimoires attributed to, you guessed it, King Solomon. Known as Le Dragon Rouge, or the Red Dragon, this book contains instructions on how to summon Lucifer, or Lucifer Refocal, for the purpose of forming a deal with the devil. The 19th century French occultist Eliphas Lévy, author of Dogme et Rituel de la Haute Magie, claimed the contemporary edition of Le Dragon Rouge was a counterfeit of a true older Grand Grimoire. And I just, I love petty historical spats. The overall work is divided into two books. The first book contains instructions for summoning a demon and for the construction of tools with which to force the demon to do one's bidding. Now the second book is divided further into two parts. The Sanctum Regnum et Secret de l'Armergie du Grand Grimoire. The Sanctum Regnum contains instructions for making a pact with the demon, allowing one to command the spirit without the tools required by book one, but at a greater risk. Secrets contain simple spells and rituals one can employ after having performed the ritual of the first book. Some editions contain a short text between these two parts, known as Le Secret Magique ou Le Grand Art de Pouvoir Par or in English, the magic secret or the grand art of being able to speak with the dead, which deals with necromancy. The book describes several demons as well as the rituals to summon them in order to make, you know, a pact with them. It also details several spells for winning a lottery, talking to spirits, being loved by somebody else, making oneself invisible, and more. This book mentions three greater demons, which are similarly prioritized in the Grimorium Verum. Sidebar, in the English translation of the work, the demons are referenced by the more generic term of spirits, which is a term I know some modern Satanists prefer. I'm kind of partial to demons. The demons that are mentioned are the Emperor Lucifer, Prince Beelzebub, and Grand Duke Astaroth. Now this book also makes mention of six lesser demons, and of course I'm gonna mention them all. So we already know Lucifer Shrofokad, Prime Minister, Satanachia, Commander-in-Chief, Agliarept, Commandant, Fleurotti, Lieutenant General, Sagatanas, Brigadier Major, Nebiros, Marshal and Inspector General. Number three, the Munich Manual of Demonic Magic. Try saying that five times fast. The MMDM or Liber Incantatonium Exorcium et Fascinatum Variarium is a 15th century grimoire manuscript. The text composed in Latin is largely concerned with demonology and necromancy. Richard Kiekeffer edited the text of the manuscript in 1998 under the title Forbidden Rites, a necromancer's manual of the 15th century. Portions of the text in English translation are presented in Forbidden Rites as well, embedded with the author's essays and explanations on the Munich manual in specific and grimoires in general. The Russian translation of this Latin grimoire was published in 2019, while the first English translation was published in only 2023. There was only one known surviving manuscript of the original Munich Manual, which is almost complete, except for the first two folios that describe the beginning of the first ritual. The rest of the grimoire contains complete instructions for the invocation of demons such as Satan, Lilith, Astaroth, and Samael, as well as the supposed attainment of favors and supernatural powers from them. Some of the spells allow for obtaining the love of a woman, achieving invisibility, acquiring wealth and treasures, 
or gaining knowledge. The text is accompanied by over 40 illustrations of magic circles and symbols to be used in the rituals. Page 130 to 133 of the text include a list of 11 demons, similar to the one from the Ars Goetia. Since there are only 11, I guess I could list them all off. So Count slash Duke Barbarous, Duke Casson, President slash Count Odious, King Kirsten, Duke Alugar, Prince Diob, President Volak, Duke Gennaren, Marquise Tuveries, President Hani, and Marquise Sukax. I promise I did my best with pronunciations today, folks. I'm a little sleepy. Most of the text is in Latin, with the exception of the two appended materials in German and Italian, which, hey, makes sense to me. Number two, the Grimorium Verum. Yep, I've already mentioned it today. I know. The Grimorium Verum, which is Latin for true grimoire, is an 18th century grimoire attributed to one Alibek the Egyptian of Memphis, who wrote it in 1517. And like many of the other ones on today's list, it does claim a tradition originating with King Solomon. The grimoire is not a translation of an earlier work, with its original appearing in French or Italian in the mid 18th century, as noted already by A. E. Waite, who discussed the work in his book of ceremonial magic in 1911, stating the date specified in the title of the grimoire of Verum is undeniably fraudulent since the work belongs to the middle of the 18th century and Memphis is Rome. One version of the grimoire was included as the Clavicles of King Solomon Book 3 in one of the French manuscripts S. L. McGregor Mathers incorporated in his version of the Key of Solomon, but it was omitted from the key with his explanation. At the end, there are some short extracts from the Grimorium Verum with the seals of evil spirits, which as they do not belong to the Key of Solomon proper, I have not given. For evident classification of the key is in two books and no more. Now Idris Shah also published some of it in The Secret Lore of Magic, Book of the Sorcerers in 1957. Alrighty, time to break down all four books. So book one is described as concerning the characters of demons, particularly the superior spirits of Lucifer, Beelzebub, Astaroth, while also including the many inferior spirits below them and their invoking sigils. Who wants to hear about what all the lesser spirits can do? So Klonek has the power to bring money to those who make a pact with them. Musisin has power over important people and politicians. Fremos has power over women. Klepoth can help you experience all sorts of dreams and visions. Kill can manifest dramatic situations and changes. Mersild has dominion over long and short distance travel. Clisthird can create confusion or enlightenment, depending on what you want or need. Sir Cod can make you see all sorts of natural and supernatural creatures. Hickpath can make a person think of you, no matter how far or distant they may be. Humots can bring you any bug you desire. Seagal will cause all sorts of prodigies to appear. Frusissier can teach you the art of necromancy. Gulan causes all illnesses. Sergat can create every kind of opportunity for advancement. Morel can help you move about unseen. Frutimier prepares all kinds of feasts for you. Husi Targaraz causes sleep in the case of some and insomnia in others. It tempted. I could use a good night's sleep. Book two is simply described as being of planetary hours, so I'll leave it up to y'all to interpret what you think that means. Book three is the preparation of the operator, or more simply put, how to prepare for summoning. Book four contains a sanctum regnum, called the Royalty of Spirits or the Little Key of Solomon, a most learned Hebraic necromancer and rabbi. This book contains various combinations of characters whereby the powers can be invoked or brought forth whensoever you may wish, each according to his faculty. Number one, Shams al -Harif. So. Shams al Marif or Shams al Marif Walata if al Arif is a 13th century grimoire centered on Arabic magic and claimed to be a manual for achieving esoteric spirituality. I apologize from the bottom of my heart if I butchered that pronunciation in any way. I promise I did practice. It was written by the scholar Ahmad al Buni, who wrote it while living in Algeria, and he passed around 1225 Common Era. This book is a patchwork of bits and pieces of al Buni's authentic works and texts by other authors. Scholars like Ibn Taminya have criticized the book and labeled al Buni as a delusion devil worshipper. Ah, good to know that across all religions over time, some things never change. In terms of more modern examples, that was a common assumption from Ed and Lorraine Warren, probably the most famed demonologist of all time. Personally, I believe half of what they investigated was real, and the other half was them just making a living, which at the end of the day, I have to give some respect to. Well, minus viewing alternate lifestyles outside of Christianity as a sin. Pardon me, I got a little sidetracked here. In contemporary form, the book consists of two volumes, the Shams al Marif al Kubra and the Shams al Marif al Sugra, with the former being the larger of the two. The first few chapters introduce the reader to magic squares and the combination of numbers in the alphabet that are believed to bring magical effect, which the author claims is the only way to communicate with jinn, angels, and spirits. The table of contents that were introduced in the later printed editions of the work contain a list of unnumbered chapters, which stretch to a number of 40. However, Prior to the printing press and, you know, various other standardizations, there were three independent volumes that circulated, each one differing in length. While being popular, it also carries a notorious reputation for being suppressed and banned from much of Islamic history, ergo how it found its way to our list today. However, it continues to persist, 
and being read and studied up to the present day, despite its questionable veracity and negative implications. Some Sufi orders, such as the Things I Cannot Say order, have recognized its legitimacy and use as a compendium for the occult and hold it in high regard. Another title by the same author, the title having been translated to The Source of the Essentials of Wisdom, is considered its companion text. In terms of translations, although a formal translation into English hasn't happened yet, there have been numerous renditions of a few of the more popular rituals found within the main treaties, as well as those that lie in its accompanying text. If you're unfamiliar with the name, Double H was one of the leading members of the Yahtzee party, so my verbiage might get interesting for the next little bit. Double H founded the Ananurb, which was a pseudo-scientific organization that was active between 1935 to 1945 and devoted to the task of promoting the racial beliefs held by the Yahtzees. Himmler was very much drawn to the occult and tied this interest into his racist philosophy, laying the proof of Aryan and Nordic racial superiority from ancient times. He promoted a cult of ancestor worship, particularly among members of the SS as a way to keep the race pure and provide immortality to the nation. Viewing the SS as an order along the lines of the Teutonic Knights, he had them take over the church of said order in Vienna in 1939. He began the process of replacing Christianity with a new moral code that rejected humanitarianism and challenged the Christian concept of marriage. Himmler modified a variety of existing customs to emphasize the elitism and central role of the SS. An SS naming ceremony was to replace baptism, marriage ceremonies were to be altered, a separate SS funeral ceremony was to be held in addition to Christian ceremonies, and SS centric celebrations of the summer and winter solstices were instituted. Historian Nicholas Godrick Clark analyzed all of this in his 1985 book, The Occult Roots of Yahtzeeism, in which he argued that there were in fact links between some ideals of Ariosophy and Yahtzee ideology. He also analyzed the problems of the numerous popular occult historiography books written on the topic. In Goodrick Clark's review, the Ariosophist movement built on the early ideas of the Volkisch movement, a traditionalist pan German response to industrialization and urbanization, but associated the problems of modernism, specifically with the supposed misdeeds of Freemasonry, Kabbalah, and Let's see if I can get this one right, folks. Rosy Crucianism, in order to prove the modern world was based on false and evil principles. The Riosophist ideals and symbols filter through several anti Semitic and nationalist groups in late Wilhelmian Germany, from which the early Yahtzee party emerged in Munich after the First World War. He demonstrated quite a few links between two Ariosophists and Heinrich Himmler. An article titled Schmittler's Forgotten Library by Timothy Ryback, published in The Atlantic, mentions a book from the Dictator's Private Library, authored by Ernst Schertl. Now, Ernst, whose interests were flagellation, dance, occultism, nudism, and quinky things, had also been active as an activist for sexual liberation before 1933. Now, supposedly there is some remnant of Yahtzee magic that can be cleaned from a study of ice magic and through the work of Blavatsky. Nevertheless, I wouldn't recommend bringing that strain of magic back into the world. Never mind finding Himmler's secret grimoire. No thanks. Next up is less a singular spell book, but more so any grimoire or spell book that promises an expertise in B L O O D magic. Sorry, folks, the interrupts are not a fan of the B word, so I have to find substitutes for the redness that pours out of a human wound. When it comes to practitioners of said magic, it's similar, if not exactly the same, as to how the Aztecs wielded power. This might sound kind of cliche, but power like that always comes with a price, which is the reason the Aztecs killed so many people. They avoided the cost by using prisoners, or folks they deemed the lowest of the low. With so much death at ritualistic points where the veil is thin, they could commune or even summon dark entities to the physical realm. So while the idea of forbidden knowledge may seem fun or rebellious or even glamorous, there are things you just shouldn't mess with in the first place. If you're looking for a specific title to avoid, one that I've talked about plenty on here that touches on the subject is the Grimorium Verum. Translated as the Grimoire of Truth, this text has a reputation that yeah, goes without saying. It originated in the 18th century and is part of European magical tradition. And uh, it's not for the faint of heart. The Grimorium Verum is essentially a guidebook, but not the kind you'd find on your local bookstore's bestseller shelf. Nah, this is more like a how-to manual for dealing with entities not exactly on the Christmas card list. The inclusion of red fluids in its rituals is one of its most chilling aspects, if you ask me. I don't really like seeing redness anywhere. It's not the kind of magic you see in fairy tales. This is the stuff of dark alleys and ancient rites. The text details ceremonies involving the shedding of said fluids to summon and control otherworldly beings. It's a kind of forbidden knowledge that's been whispered about in hushed tones throughout history. Like it's just like you hear about it, you don't talk about it. Also, it doesn't stop at fluid exchanges. Like it's an overall comprehensive guide to dealing with demons. Like if you want to make a pact with a demon, yeah, this is the place for it. It's got the instructions for creating a pact, specific prayers and invocations. Technically, it's like a step-by-step -step guide for anybody seeking supernatural assistance. Whether that's a good idea or not, 
that's up for debate. So why was this banned? And why should you not be reading it? Well, let's just say the church, who we all love, wasn't exactly thrilled about people trying to summon demons on a random Tuesday afternoon. The church authorities saw these texts as a threat, not just to the spiritual well-being of their practitioners, but also to the established order. If there's one thing we know about the church, they don't like being threatened. After all, summoning demons and dabbling in fluid magic doesn't exactly align with a Sunday sermon. Not that I personally agree with the church on most things, but this might be the one time I do. You don't want a demon at Thanksgiving. Okie dokie folks, are you ready for some more fun cult stuff? Okay, so you've all heard about Scientology, right? The cult that pretty much owns Tom Cruise and a bunch of other celebrities? Well, it turns out that their original founder wrote a book that he alleged caused people to take their own lives. And if that isn't magically inclined in some way, I don't know what is. It prompts reflection on the power dynamics between the written word, belief systems, and the vulnerability of the human psyche. So what is it about this text that can drive individuals to the brink? Well, apparently it's the allure of the unknown, the manipulation of belief systems, maybe a combination of factors that pushes people beyond the boundaries of reason. So we've talked about this guy before, L. Ron Hubbard. He was discussing the Atlantis civilization, and he claimed to have gained this knowledge through his own research and experiences. Am I going to pretend like I know how he experienced those things? Nope. But here's the thing. This piece of writing has been almost entirely erased from the internet. If you're more tech savvy than I am, feel free to add links in the comments section. But outside of venturing into the dark web, I couldn't find a copy of this specific work anywhere or a listing on any official record of all of this. The erasure of almost all mentions of this book from the vast expanse of the internet only adds to the mystery in my mind. In this crazy digital age where I can Google whatever I want, the ability to expunge a work from the digital realm raises quite a few questions about the extent of control over the narrative. Not to sound like my university profs. It's as if the book itself has become this elusive specter, lingering in the shadows of cyberspace. Now, I'm not completely oblivious to the control that present day Scientology has in our society, but it's really scary to see it in practice. Like, their attempt to erase any traces of this work raises so many ethical questions about the control of information. In this digital age, where information is considered a cornerstone of freedom, the deliberate suppression of a narrative kind of is like, what the heck? Like, what other forbidden books are there? Just like waiting in the shadows that I don't even know about waiting to disturb some minds out there. Well, there's the Shams al-Marif, or Shams al-Marif wa lata if al-Awarif, which is a 13th century grimoire centered on Arabic magic and has claimed to be a manual for achieving esoteric spirituality. I apologize from the bottom of my heart if I butchered that pronunciation anyway. I promise I did practice. It was written by the scholar Ahmed al buni who wrote it while living in Algeria. He passed around 1225 Common Era. It was written by the scholar Ahmed al buni who wrote it while living in Algeria and he passed around 1225 Common Era. Now, the book is a patchwork of bits and pieces of the author's authentic works, and texts by other authors. Scholars like Ibn Tamiya have criticized the book and labeled Albuni as a deluded double worshipper. Eh, good to know that across all religions, over time, some things never changed. Now, in terms of more modern examples, that was a common assumption from Ed and Lorraine Warren. You know, the demonologist that I quote all the time? Look, I believe half of what they investigated was real, the other half was them making a living, which at the end of the day, I have to give some respect to. Well, minus viewing alternative lifestyles outside of Christianity as a sin. Okay, pardon me. Sorry, I get a little sidetracked. In contemporary form, the book consists of two volumes, the Shams al-Marif al-Kubra and the Shams al-Marif al-Sukra, with the former being the larger of the two. The first few chapters introduce the reader to magic squares and the combination of numbers and the alphabet that are believed to bring magical effect, which the author claims is the only way to communicate with jinn, angels, and spirits. The table of contents that were introduced in the later printed editions of the work contain a list of unnumbered chapters, which stretched to a number of 40, by the way. However, prior to the printing press and various other standardizations, there were three independent volumes that circulated, each one differing in length. While being popular, it also carries a notorious reputation for being suppressed and banned for much of Islamic history, ergo how it found its way to our list today. Don't read it. However, it continues to persist in being read and studied up to present day, despite its questionable veracity and negative implications. Some Sufi orders, such as the Naqshbandi Hakwani order, have recognized its legitimacy and use as a compendium for the occult and hold it in high respect. Now, another title by the same author, the title having been translated to the Source of the Essentials of Wisdom, is considered its companion text. In terms of translation, although the overall formal translation to English hasn't really happened yet, there have been numerous renditions of a few of the more popular rituals found within the main treaties, as well as those that lie in its accompanying text. So. Don't bother, don't go near it. Okay folks, I think I'm gonna end today with the Munich Manual of Demonic Magic. The MMDM, or Liber Incantionium, Exorcium et Fascinatorium Verbarium. <laughs> Let me try that again. The MMDM, or, well, let's see if I can get this folks, Liber Incantationum, Exorcimorum et Fascinatinium 
Variarum is a 15th century grimoire manuscript. The text composed in Latin is largely concerned with demonology and necromancy. Richard Kikafer edited the text of the manuscript in 1998 under the title Forbidden Rites, a necromancer's manual of the 15th century. Portions of the text in English translation are presented in Forbidden Rites as well, embedded within the author's essays and explanations on the Munich manual in specific and grimoires in general. The Russian translation of this Latin grimoire was published in 2019, while the first English translation only came out last year. Now, there is only one known surviving manuscript of the original Munich Manual, which is almost complete, except for the first two folios that describe the beginning of the first ritual. The rest of the grimoire contains complete instructions for the invocation of demons such as, hmm, let's see, Satan, Lilith, Asaroth, and Semel, as well as the supposed attainment of favors and supernatural powers from them. Some of the spells allow for obtaining the love of a woman, achieving invisibility, acquiring wealth and treasures, or gaining knowledge. The text is accompanied by over 40 illustrations of magic circles and symbols to be used in said rituals. So, for example, page 130 to 133 of the text includes a list of 11 demons, similar to the Ars Goetia. And since there's only 11, I guess I could list them off. So we've got Count Slash Duke Barbarus, Duke Cassin, President Slash Count Otius, King Curson, Duke Alugor, Prince Tub, President of Volak, Duke Generon, Marquis Tuveries, President Hani, and Marquis Sukax. I promise I did my best. Most of the text is in Latin, which is not a language I speak, with the exception of two appended materials in German and Italian. So let's see, we got messing with demons and manipulation of others to your will? Yeah, no thanks, that sounds like a recipe for disaster. 